Okay, so in our previous video, we saw, we sampled, we saw the necessity of sampling, and we saw the characteristics of sampling. That, hey, every time we sample, we get new data, very unlikely that we're going to get the exact same members of the population in each sample. As a result of that, it's unlikely any sample will have the exact same value of x bar, meaning that every value that we obtain, every sample mean we calculate from each sample is going to be unique. That is, our sample mean itself, our values of x bar, will themselves be a random variable such that these random variables are, as we saw the big kind of takeaway, this random variable of our sample mean is normally distributed. We then saw the big part there as to our conditions that needed to be met in order for our sample mean to be randomly distributed, and those conditions were as seen here. That we had a case where, let's scroll up here, if our population, so if our distribution of x, if we could assume that that was normal, well, if we could assume normality, well, then, yes, we could say that x bar was normally distributed as well. If our population of x was symmetric, so here I have a uniform as a symmetric. It doesn't have to be uniform. We could have any symmetric distribution here. So just to give you an example, maybe it's something that looks more like this. Right? In that case there, that's roughly a symmetric distribution. I attempted to make it a roughly symmetric distribution. If we had a symmetric distribution as such, that is, again, symmetry is just such that the mu, that is our population mean, equals our median. If that is true, well then, our sample mean, our random variable, will be normally distributed if we're pulling out sample sizes bigger than 10. Well, 10 or more. Finally, if x is just unknown, if we don't even know how x is distributed, it's really skewed, it's got really thick tails, or we just have no idea at all, well, fear not. Given this complete ignorance of x, we can still say that our sample mean is normally distributed if and only if we pull out a sample size greater than or equal to 30. So if these conditions are met based off of our knowledge of the underlying distribution or assumption of the underlying population, based off of this, we need some basic sample size and we can then invoke that our sample mean will be normally distributed, centered around the true population mean with a known standard deviation, such that the bigger our sample size is, the more tightly will be packed to that true population mean. Okay, let's take a look at how exactly we can utilize this. So let's jump over and take a look. Bit of an example here, of a wordy example, right? And that's always the problem with statistics, is kind of trying to pick out the important information from all the fluff. So what exactly is in here? We're talking about Phillips Brewery here in Victoria, and they're gonna be brewing Blue Buck. And they need to confirm how much beer is being put into each bottle. So the bottle states, hey, there's 341 mils in each bottle, and Phillips needs to make sure that, well, they're not having anything less than that, otherwise they're lying. They also don't want much more than that, or they're giving away free product. Okay, so we know that, what do we know? It is known that the standard deviation of volume across all Phillips products is only 0.8 milliliters and roughly follows a uniform distribution. So, okay, why is that important? Well, okay, that is saying that the standard deviation of X, so the standard deviation of our fill across all products is 0.8, and that we follow a uniform distribution. Well, this bit here, uniform distribution, is important because the uniform distribution is symmetric. So, okay, if that's symmetric, in order to appeal to the central limit theorem, in order to say that, hey, X bar is normally distributed, with some mean and some standard deviation. This guy here, all together, standard deviation of x bar, that's pretty wordy, standard deviation of x bar. This is often called instead the standard error. Okay, so in order to assume that this is true, in order to assume that x bar is normally distributed, uniform distribution, we are going to need a sample size greater than or equal to 10. Okay, 
So we have our initial context for the question. Then typically the question itself, usually it's the last sentence. So is this bit here. As a quality control analyst, you randomly select 16 bottles off the production line. So, okay. Hey, great. We said we needed a sample size bigger than 10. We have 16. We're golden. Okay. We find that the average volume of these 16 bottles, so that is we pulled out a sample size of 16 and we calculated a sample average of 341.35. So, oh, it looks like we're overfilling, right? We're getting an average that's bigger than what it should be. We're saying, hey, our average should be 341. We want to know, is this a likely result? What is the probability of observing this volume or more? Okay, so how do we work this up? Well, the way that we do this is we keep in mind that X bar is normally distributed. So let's go and work through that. We're going to have a normal distribution. This is my distribution of X bar such that it is normal and it is centered around what I'm presuming to be my true population mean of 341. Right? That's what I'm saying my bottle should be filled to, 341 milliliters. That's on average what I should be getting in the population. I obtain, though, a sample mean of 341.35. So that is I have some value like this. 341.35, that's bigger to the right. So 341.35. I want to know... Hey, what was the probability of observing this volume or more? So I'm looking for this area underneath my normal distribution. That area there. Okay. Just like before, we can't do anything with this random variable on its own. Right? We have some mean. Some mean. And we're going to have some standard deviation, in this case not standard deviation of x, but of x bar, that's our standard error, which will be standard deviation of x over root n. So what's that? 0 0.8 all over root 16, right? Root n, sample size of 16. Okay, can't do anything with this distribution on its own. What I need to do is I need to convert this into a z. So I need to get my value of x, I need to transform, sorry not value of x, value of x bar, I need to transform it into a z distribution. And just like we did before with just our x random variable when we assumed x was normally distributed, we go through this process and we'll get some new mean such that that will be zero, right, for our z distribution, let's recall, Z was normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we're going to get that and we'll get some corresponding, we'll call this guy here, Z1, right? Some corresponding Z value that's attached to this observation, this sample mean of 341.35. How do we go about making this transition though? Well, keep in mind when we had x to z, so right now we have x bar to z, but when we had x to z, we went as such. We said, okay, z was x, our random variable, minus our mean, all over our standard deviation. Okay, that was the idea there. We just said, how far has our observation of interest deviated from the mean versus the number of standard deviations? In our case, well, we don't have x, so that's not going to work for us in this case, but our standardization formula is actually the exact same. It's going to be, well, instead of x, we have x bar, so I want to know, hey, what is my sampling error? How far is x bar from the true population mean? What is this sampling error? And then I'm going to divide it, instead of by the standard deviation, I'm going to divide it by my standard error. Right, that is the standard deviation of my sampling mean. So that in this case here is going to be the standard deviation of x all over 
root n. So, okay, it looks like a new formula. It really isn't. We're doing the same thing we were before. It was my random variable of interest minus my mean divided by the standard deviation of that random variable. In this case, our random variable is the sampling mean. And in this case, our standard deviation is known as the standard error. So, bit of a change in terminology, but same process. So let's work through this. What's going to be the value of my z? 341.35 minus 341 all over, all over 0 0.8 root 16. So, okay, we can work that out. That won't be too bad. In the numerator, I'm just going to get 0 0.35. In the denominator, I get 0.8 divided by the square root of 16, which gives me 0 0.20. So altogether, 0.35 divided by 0.2, that gives me 1.75. So there's my z value, 1.75. From here now, I need to work out my probability, right? I want to know, hey, what was the probability, what was the likelihood of witnessing 341.35, that is 1.75, or more, right? Keep in mind, that's all the way to positive infinity. Okay. To do so, again, I need to go and take 1.75 to my stats table. So let's go jump to our stats table, and let's go take a look here. So referring to my stats table, keeping in mind, always take a look at that picture at the top. We get a probability, that picture at the top is saying the probability reported is between 1.75 and the mean. So we go down the left-hand column, we find 1.7, and then we cut across to 0 0.05. And what we get is we get a probability of 0.4599. Zero point four five nine nine, meaning this area here is forty five point nine nine percent. Well, okay, that's not the area we're looking for, though. We're looking for that red area. So, how do we find that red area? Well, let's keep in mind that this is a symmetric distribution, so that is the mean equals the median, so all the way from the mean to infinity is 50 percent so okay if this whole half is 50 percent and this bit here is almost 46 percent this guy here is going to be 0 0.0401 and therefore we can work out a probability that we get a fill volume in our sample an average fill volume in our sample of 341.35 milliliters or more is 0 0.0401 we can go wow that was actually a pretty unlikely result it was very unlikely that i witnessed that fill volume or more extreme meaning that okay if i was the quality control analyst here i was like that's actually a pretty significant overfill it was pretty unlikely for me to be able to calculate that average from my sample maybe i need to recalibrate my machine Maybe my machine isn't calibrated properly and I'm overfilling. So the way that we can utilize this, the way that we can get some insight by saying, hey, I pulled out a whole bunch of random ones, calculated mean, what was the likelihood that I got that mean or more extreme? In this case, yeah, it wasn't very likely. Very unlikely, meaning something's probably wrong. Let's take a look at another example as to how we would work through that. Okay, so in this example here, we have 500 racers at an upcoming stage event. On average, racers finish each stage in 5 minutes with a standard deviation of 1.25 minutes. It is thought the finishing time of racers is roughly normal. Okay, so again, typically in a question, you're going to be given a whole bunch of context. Then it's typically the last, the last sentence or maybe sentence plus. That's our actual question itself. So break that apart. This last bit here, our actual question itself. If we pulled out a random sample of four racers, what would be the probability that their average stage time is longer than six minutes and 15 seconds? So, okay. 
what you'll hopefully have noticed is that one of the big things now as we've moved forward is that we actually have two different normal distributions going on now. We have our normal distribution of x, and we could ask questions about this, saying, hey, x is normally distributed. What's the likelihood that I witness some value of x or more extreme? I also have this guy here where it's, okay, I have x bar instead of x. I have my sample mean, which is also normally distributed, centered around there. And in this case, I'm saying, hey, what's the likelihood I pull out some average value or more extreme, given my mean, right? And so in this case here, ah, fundamentally different questions. What's, right, and to kind of phrase it in the terms of the question we're asking, what's the probability that a racer finishes in more than six minutes and 15 seconds, right? A racer, one single racer, given my average finish time and standard deviation, versus this guy here, what is the probability that an average from, I pick out a group of racers, and from these group of racers, what's the probability that their average finish time is longer than six minutes, 15 seconds, right? It's never gonna say explicitly in the question, use the central limit theorem or use the normal distribution of X you have to be able to infer which tool to pull out of the toolbox, right? And that's the tough part. That is the toughest part as we move forward in the course. Everything is normally distributed, more or less. You have to work out what distribution, which kind of angle to take on it. So in this case, what do we have going on? Well, we pulled out a random sample of four racers. So, okay, right there, N equals four. I have a sample size. That to me is screaming that we're going to be dealing with sample average. But, right, that's not, that's not necessarily for sure, but it's a strong hint. On then, what would be the probability that their average stage time is longer than 6 minutes 15? So that these four racers have an average that is greater than or equal to 6 minutes and 15 seconds. So... Okay, right there, I'm being told some value of x bar. I want to know the likelihood of that value of x bar or bigger, right? So I'm dealing with a sample average. Okay, that all being said, we now need to say, do we have a large enough sample size, right? We have this whole bit, n needs to be greater than 3, n needs to be greater than 10, and, whoa, n needs to be greater than 30. Right, again, three if we can assume the population is normal, 10 if symmetric, and 30 if the population distribution is unknown. Well, what do we have here? 500 racers, so right, if we wanted to kind of like say what things are as we went through this, that's my population. 500 racers in an upcoming event. On average, racers finish each stage in five minutes. So, okay, this average is attached to my population. So that's going to be my mu. That's my average, my population average with a standard deviation of 1.25 minutes. That guy there, that's my standard deviation of X. It is thought the finishing time of racers is roughly normal. So, okay, check, normal, I can deal with this world. I need a sample size of three or more. What do I have? Four check, I'm good to go. I can carry on with this question. Okay, let's make some room and let's answer this. So we have distribution of X bar. We know that X bar is normally distributed, centered around the true population. mean. So that is centered around a true population mean of five with a standard deviation of X bar, that is our standard error, is going to be Standard deviation of x all over root n. So what is that? 1.25 all over the square root of 4. Okay. I pull out a value of x bar, a sample mean, of 6 minutes and 15 seconds. I don't know what the likelihood is that they finish in this or more. So, okay, that is saying 
six minutes and 15 seconds or more, I'm looking for that area. Okay, here's the thing, really need to keep track of our units here. X bar is being measured in minutes. What I often see in this kind of question is people go, okay, six minutes, 15 seconds, that is 6.15. No, no, it is not 6.15. That there, that is 6.25. You're like, two five, where, where does that come from? Well, keep in mind that there are 60 seconds in a minute. So if we go and we do 15 over 60, right? So 15 over 60, that gives us 0 0.25, meaning 15 seconds is a quarter of a minute. So if you're going to do this where we have two different units going on, one unit being minutes, one minute unit being seconds, you have to convert the question to be entirely in one unit. We could have converted this to be entirely in seconds, right? We could have said, hey, okay, five times 60 is 300. And we could have gone, okay, 300 is our mean and gone that way. I figured that was a whole bunch of work. I didn't want to go that way. So we left it in minutes. Just change 615 to 6.25. Okay, great. We now have that. How do we solve this question? Again, we cannot do anything with X bar itself. We need to transform X bar into a Z. And so to do that, X bar to Z, our mean drops down to become zero. We need to work out what 6.25 is. So to standardize, Z is always our random variable of interest. So 6.25 minus our mean all over our standard deviation. So 1.25 all over root four. To work that guy out, what do we have in our numerator? We have 1.25. In our denominator, we have 1.25 divided by square root of four. So that's 0 0.625, okay. 1.25 divided by 0.625 gives me 2. Now, okay, Z values are reported to two decimal places, so we get 2 as our Z. Next step, we have our Z value. After we have our Z value, we have to go to our table. We have to work out our probability. Keeping in mind that probability we're working out is between 2 and the mean. So as we go through that, Go down the left hand side to get to 2.0, over to the next zero, and we get probability of 0.4772. So there we go, 0 0.4772. This is not our answer again. We are interested in this area over here. And so we need to invoke that fact that this whole right hand side is 50%. We're just interested in this leftover. So we'll need to go 0.5 minus 0.4772. And we get our yellow area as 0 0.0228. Two, two, so about a 2.28% chance that a random sample of four racers would take longer than six minutes and 15 seconds to complete. So how we can work that out, how we can interpret the final result. Okay, so that does us for our distribution of the sample mean, our central limit theorem, ways we can work through that. This really, this central limit theorem, this distribution of the sample mean is really what a lot of the rest of the course is based off of. We saw the progression already of the normal distribution of X to this. As we carry forward in the course, it'll be much of the same. So keep that in mind. This is something you want to do lots of practice with, lots of questions on the D2L quizzes. Make sure you're comfortable working around with this, finding out the areas underneath the curve and whether or not you can apply the central limit theorem. Big thing as well is differentiating between 
hey, are we asking about a question of x being normally distributed or x bar, the sample average being normally distributed? Very, very different questions. If you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me, either D2L or email.